10. All right. So, Stephen, nice is yours. Thank you, brother. Learning for all with Stephen. <laughs> Class number three. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. I didn't know you were running. Two people. All right. All right. Grab your Bibles open to Joshua chapter number seven. Grab your Bibles open to Joshua chapter number seven. We're going to jump into it tonight. I have something that I think uh, will help you because it was a great help to me uh, when I learned it several years ago. And so, Lord willing, we'll be able to, to get to it. But first, I want to look at... Look at some things in the Bible about Joshua and some things that he did and didn't do. And, uh, yeah. But uh, once everybody's turned there, Joshua chapter 7, we'll pray real quick. And then I don't want to keep you guys really long because, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like the appetizer. And then you have, like, the big burritos coming next. And so I feel like I, feel like I don't want to just, like, you know, to hog the night. So one preacher said, as long as you don't preach as long... You know, preach a shorter message than the second guy, you'll be okay. So last night, he went two hours. <laughs> I am positive I can keep it under two hours. So Amen. I feel like I can do this. But I love you, Brother Caden, and I have learned a lot Amen. from your Amen. preaching. And, um, yeah, it's vivid memories that are probably not going to go away for a while. Yeah. You just have a way to paint the Bible, and I love that. I love it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much again for an opportunity for us to be able to learn from you. I pray that you would just, again, just open up our hearts, open up our mind, help us to be able to look at some things from the Bible that can help us, that apply to us, that draw us closer to you to make the Christian life a little bit more understandable and uh, help us to be able to accept these things, hold on to them, and then live them when we go home. We ask this in your name, knowing that you'll help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Joshua chapter number 7, and we're going to jump down. Of course, this afternoon we talked about how Achan took something that wasn't his. And he saw it, he coveted it, he took it, and he hid it. And that was his four-point outline of what not to do in life. Okay, it'll get you killed. Ask him. So what he did, though, is Joshua comes, and I want you to look at this. Joshua is a leader. From his perspective, he's doing everything right that he knows of. He's not, like, purposely disobeying God. He's just not purposely acknowledging God so that God directs his path. Does that make sense? So he's not doing wrong to do wrong. He's just not purposely doing right. Sometimes that is totally a category that I fall into, and I think we fall into. So that being said, Joshua sends the people out. He is expecting them to come back and say, AI is gone, what's next? And they come back and say, 36 men are gone, and we're all scared to death. And Joshua is quite literally devastated. I want you to look at this. Verse number six. And Joshua rent his clothes, fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the even tide. I don't know when those guys came back. But whenever they came back, it was from then until the evening that Joshua was on his face. I don't know if he was talking. I don't know if he was praying. I don't know if he was crying. But he was on his face before the ark of the Lord. And he put dust upon his head and the elders of Israel with him. I'm paraphrasing that last part. Verse number 7. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God. So now he breaks the silence and he starts talking to God. And I want you to notice that he's just direct. He just talks to God. Sometimes we feel like when we talk to God, it's got to be some fancy super spiritual lingo. And it doesn't. You can just talk to God. Like he's your friend, because that's what he wants to be. Now, he's also all of those really cool, awesome, powerful, unimaginable, unfathomable things, but he's also your friend. And, and I mean, treat him like that. Don't treat him like he's very distant. You've got to approach him with, with some kind of um, distance between you. All right, verse number seven. Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan? He's saying, why did you guys even bring us over Jordan? to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites, to destroy us. Would to God, now look at his thoughts here, he's drawing a conclusion. Would to God that we had been content and dwelt on the other side, Jordan. I gotta keep going. Okay, verse number eight. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and the inhabitants of the land shall hear it. 
and she'll environ us round, that's to encircle them around, and then cut off our name from the earth, and what wilt thou do unto thy great name? Now, there's a couple things that I want to bring out real, real quick. I want you to think about it real quick. You just read that passage. Here's some things that I saw. First of all, this is the first real defeat that Joshua's had as a leader. And he didn't handle it well. Look at why. Why I say that. He didn't handle this defeat really well. Um, why did, his question to God. Why did you bring us over here with the purpose to deliver us to the Amorites so that they could destroy us? His first thought was, I'd be fine staying over there on the other side of Jordan. I would rather stay over there in the wilderness and eat manna and not enter the promised land than come over here and fail. Really? Really? The land that God promised you. You'd rather be in the wilderness and just not fail than to be over here and have a failure. Guys, failure is not as big of a deal as we play it up to be. Let's look at the next thing. Wishing that he was content and had not tried anything great. He says, I, I wish I was over there. I wish we didn't even come over here and, and attack these places. I, was, I, would, I would have been content over there if he left us there. And, by the way, as if it was his idea to conquer the land of Canaan. Yeah. It wasn't his idea. He was following God, and God brought him to this point. And, by the way, God brought defeat. God did that. Okay? God brought defeat on purpose. We're going to look at that a little bit later. And then he, he says something else. Look at this. What do I say to Israel? What are other people going to think? Let, let, let's check this out. He says, I'm working with cowards. He says, what am I going to say to Israel? When everybody turns around, they just run away. He says, now, now think of it like this. We would say in our lingo, God, you messed up my perfect winning streak. I was on a roll, and you threw a monkey wrench in, and now I, I have an imperfect winning streak, and i got to try to get my points back up. You know what I'm saying? Like, obviously, a slightly gamer talk, but then it says, the whole land is going to converge on us. Now, look at how there's a progression. I would have been happy over there, not fighting at all. Why did you bring us here if you're just going to kill us? I'm working with a bunch of cowards, okay? The whole land is going to kill us all. Do you see a progression here? Yeah, I, I see a progression. I mean, it's pretty clear to me. And so it says, yeah, the whole land, look at this, the whole land is going to converge on us. They're going to surround us. And, and listen to what he's implying. God, you're not going to be able to save us. We're just going to be wiped off the face of the map, and you're not going to be able to do a thing about it. And what is going to happen to your great name? It sounds like defeat. Like utter, to the bottom, defeat. He ain't got no hope at all. And then... In verse number 10, God replies to Joshua. I think it's interesting. His final thought that everybody's going to die. The world is going to end. And sometimes we can feel the same way when we make a mistake. We get embarrassed. Something goes wrong. We fail epically. I've done many, many, many times in my life. And, and, and then we say it's just over. Throw in the towel. Call it quits. I'm going to hang up my Bible. Hang up my Christian lifestyle. It's done. I can't go any farther. God ran out of miracles. Let's look at this. Verse 10. <laughs> I love God's reply. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Notice the first words out of God's mouth. Why are you on your face? Get up. Stop whining. Look at, look at the next part here. He says, Wherefore hast thou liest thou thus upon thy face? Why are you laying in the sand? He says, Get up. Talk to me. Then verse number 11. Israel hath sinned. Notice this. God did not address anything he said. God didn't. God said, get up. Why are you whining on your face? You did something. You, you sinned. There's a reason for this. See, Joshua, I don't know what he thought. Maybe he thought, you know, God's just against us now. I don't know. That doesn't make sense to me. But at some point, he thought that God wasn't for him because God's telling him here, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> They've sinned against me. There's a reason why I brought defeat, and there's something I want you to do about it. Look at the next part. He, they also transgressed against my covenant, which I commanded them, for they have eaten, I'm sorry, they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and disassembled also, and have 
and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. And then he gives them some directions. How to get the head over the wall. How to get the, the sin out in the open. How to deal with the problem. And that's what I want to look at tonight. I want to look at how to deal with defeat. How to not just deal with it. Because that kind of sounds like you're coping. I hate coping. Okay, We are more than conquerors yes. to yeah. him in Christ Jesus. If yeah. you're saved, Mitchell, where'd you go? You are more than conquerors yeah. in Christ Jesus. Yeah. In his strength. I can do all things, but the key is through Christ. Yes. And that's oftentimes what we leave out. I can do all things. Well, no, you can't. But through Christ, you can't. Because God gives the victory. Look at this. There's a couple things that I see, first of all. First of all, I want you to look at this. How does God react to our failures? And he gave a command. Get up. He asked a question. Why are you on your face? And then he listed the problems, and he gave the directions of how to actually get victory over this. Now, I have a question. I wonder at this point, what would have happened, Brother Dave, if Joshua said, well, but I don't think that that's a big deal. If they just took some stuff. We gave like 99.5% of it to you. And if we just took like 0.05%, some guy hit it in his tent, I don't really think that's a problem. That would be the equivalent of saying, well, I know what the Bible says, but I just don't think that's a problem for me. Yeah. Or, well, I just don't see that in the Bible. Brother Gray sees it. Pastor sees it. Brother Dave sees it. Brother McLellan sees it. But I just don't see it in the Bible. That's the same as, that's, that'd be the same as what he's saying. And notice what God said. I will no more be with you. And that is to say, you will not grow anymore. Yeah. You'll, not con- you'll not have any more victories in Canaan until you deal with this. I think a lot of Christians top out there. They reach a place and they go, I think that's okay. And God says, well, that's where you're staying until you deal with that. Yeah. I think it's dangerous to us because we want to grow. We're, we're at the altar crying and trying to figure out why we're not growing. And God's saying, remember that thing you hid in your tent? Yeah. Remember that thing? I've been talking to you about it and you keep saying, but God, it's not a problem. I don't see anything wrong with it. Anyway, moving on. Look at this. I, I, before I do anything else, I've got to make sure you understand this. So, so before you get lost in any crazy drawings that I have and trying to mimic me or whatever, we're going to, we're going to look at God's reaction any time you fail. And I don't care. I, I really don't care what it is that you fail at. How big your sin is, how small your sin is, the question is, are you a Christian? If you're a Christian, I personally believe God reacts the same way. Okay, let me show you. Picture a shepherd. He's got a sheep. Small lamb. He takes the lamb. He wants the lamb to stay with him. Okay? Using an analogy here. The lamb doesn't stay with him. Keeps running off. Now, the shepherd can do several things. So maybe the shepherd gets a little leash, ties the, the lamb, so he, he, he has to stay within a certain distance. And the lamb all day long is nothing but jerking that chain. He Resistance, 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 not listening, not, not wanting. So... I've heard that back in the Bible times, they take the lamb and they break the leg in a specific way. So that I'm glad God doesn't do this anymore, man. <laughs> Both of my legs would be broken twice, okay? But he breaks the leg and then the lamb has to heal. Can't walk anywhere. So the shepherd carries it everywhere. I think that'll be a lot of work for the shepherd, man. A lot of extra work. So, but, but the shepherd, that catches loves the sheep. Yeah. That's why he does it. Wow. So he carries the sheep everywhere he goes, and he gets a relationship with the sheep. Now once the leg heals, sets the sheep back down. Now the sheep and the shepherd are best friends because of the personal time that the shepherd invested in the sheep after the pain that the shepherd caused the sheep. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. God did that on purpose in order to get something, a closer relationship. Now, there's some other ways that a shepherd could deal with the sheep. If, for instance, the sheep was responsive but got distracted, the shepherd would have a staff. And he would take the staff and just guide, touch the sheep and like guide the sheep back in. And if he touches the sheep and it feels pressure, if the sheep responds to the slight pressure, no further corrections needed. 
No leg breaking is needed. No leashes are needed. He just touches the sheep. Sheep goes, oh yeah, I got distracted looking at that. I got to come back over here with the rest of the sheep. You see what I'm saying? Or the sheep says, oh, like, I'm not listening to that, and keeps walking in the same direction. In which case, depending on the size of the sheep, the shepherd would have to take some pretty drastic measures to get that sheep to turn back around. He might whack it harder. He might loop something around his neck and drag it. In the New Testament, the Bible says, uh, uh, it might not be in the New Testament. Correct me if I'm wrong. But um, God says, hey, you don't want to be as a mule or as a horse that has to have a bit put in its mouth. God says I, uh, in Psalms, I want to lead you with my eye. My eye. I just want to look at you and you go, oh, that's it. I'm following. I'm tracking. I'm not doing that anymore. Or I am doing that now because you just looked at me and I know what that means. You touched my heart and I'm just going to respond to you. Now, catch this phrase. God will always, always, always respond to your failure with love. If you're saved, that's it. You are no longer a sinner. We'll get to that. You are a saint who sins. Okay? And if you are a saint that sins, God's goal is to edify you, to build you up. Amen. Now, all of you guys know Riker. I'm going to leave you with this illustration. We'll go on. But the idea is if Riker's learning how to walk, I am not going to... Just picture this in your mind. You probably could see me doing this. But if Riker's learning how to walk, I've got him by his fingers, he's waddling back and forth, and then I let go of his fingers, and he's waddling, and then he falls down on his can. So I do what any normal, loving parent would do. I kick him, I pick him up, I throw him down, and I say, you are a failure, I'm giving up on you. Wow. Guys, you and I both know I'd never do that. Unless it was really, really extreme circumstances. No, I'm just kidding. But, but the point is, we know that's not normal. But somehow Satan slips that in there and says, Hey, even though you're saved, even though you're a child of God, even though God says he loves you unconditionally, even though he died on the cross, as soon as you mess up, man, you are in the doghouse. That's not how God comes to us. Okay? you got to get that in your mind. You guys following me or no? Yes. Okay, okay. Amen. Okay. I just, that is so important. You, if you miss that, you miss so much in the Christian life. Yeah. Now, Proverbs 14, 15, or 12, 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is what? I want all of you to fall into that category. So tonight, I want to try to share some of God's wisdom. I ain't got none. So I'm going to try to share some of God's wisdom with you, and hopefully you can hold on to just a little bit of it. In Joshua 7, verse number 19, look at what happens. And Joshua said unto Achan, the son, uh, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel. Notice the attitude that Joshua comes after they pinpoint the fact that Achan did this wrong. He says, My son. He didn't say, You loser. He didn't say, You idiot. He said, My son. My son. Give glory to God. Tell me what you did. And you see the confession that came here. In verse number 20, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. Most of us want to stop right there. Because it's, it's pretty easy to say, All right, I messed up. I messed up. I shouldn't have done that. I was wrong. But this is what we don't want to do. Look at this. In verse number 22, so Joshua sent messengers, and they ran unto the tent, and behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. You know what we don't want to do is oftentimes the repentance part, the part where we confess and agree with God, hey, yeah. I sinned, I blew up big time, yeah. and uh, yeah, here's what I did. That's where we get stuck. Yeah. Our parents say, did you do, oh yeah, yeah, I messed up. Okay, tell me what you did. Cry it out of me. Oh, there's no way I'm going to open up and voluntarily tell you anything. Cry it out. And that, that ought not be. We'll get to that in a little bit. So, lay the problem out before God. They took that and they laid it out before God, uh, out before the, the congregation of Israel, the assembly of Israel. And may I say, it may take some extreme measures to fix the problem. I've seen parents take extreme measures to fix problems and I've only seen 
uh, when the teenagers, when the young people, when we as people, anybody responds to the extreme measures that God brings into our life, when we respond positively, guess how it ends? It's going to be hard to believe. Positive. When we respond negatively, guess how it turns out? Remember that 100%, 100% I was talking about earlier? Yeah. You know, when you follow God, it gives you victory 100% of the time. When you do what you want to do, you get defeat 100% of the time. And our problem is, we kind of like to lean this direction too much. So that being said, usually it's not enough to say, I was wrong. There is so much more. You've got to actually expose the problem. And let, let catch this, work with your parents yeah. to deal with the problem. You are not the problem. What you did was the problem. So work with your parents, Amen. with the problem, and then deal with it. And guys, you might have to put on some big boy pants or maturity up, mature up a little bit um, if your parents can't separate that. I don't know all your parents. And there's a good possibility your parents could easily attack you for your sin. Sorry, if I was talking to your parents, I'd talk to them about it. Okay, but I'm talking to you guys. So... If you're going to mature past that, you got to actually kind of mature past that and say, okay, my parents are attacking me right now, but I know I'm not the problem. What I did was the problem. You catching what I'm saying? You got, you've got to do that. Because if they attack you, oh, it's so hard not to get there. So, so hard to deal with the problem. Because they're attacking who you are now and your character rather than what you did and the problem. And so I wish that all parents were, were to that place where they understood that, but I know that's not the case. So be patient with your parents. They are you that has grown up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. They're, I, right. Trust me, I'm a parent now. I ain't right. nothing that I knew. But, uh, I didn't gain any wisdom just by having a son. I wish that wasn't the case. But the last portion is victory. Guys, like I talked about earlier, victory. It comes, look at this, Joshua 8 and verse number 1. By the way, just to finish the story, Achan died, family died, all of his uh, possessions and stuff were stoned and then burned. A lot of heartache, a lot of sorrow, and it's all because he saw. you got to be so careful what you look at, what you spend your time on, what you lust after. It could destroy you very, very easily, and I think that that's... Part of the problem is it just it's too easy to get destroyed by something that we think, ah, it's not really a problem. Verse number eight, or verse number one of chapter number eight. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee. Now, maybe that was God's plan all along, but if Joshua would have asked, he would have known that. And then it says, And arise and go to Ai. See, I have given it into thy hand. The king of Ai and his people, and his city, and his land. Now, this is the best part. Check it out. Verse number two. Thou shalt do to Ai and her king as thou didst unto Jericho and her king. Okay, it's a little bit of repeat here. Only, check this out, the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall ye take for a prey unto yourselves. Lay thee an ambush for the city behind it. God is into rewarding us. Guys, it's not like we do right, and we do right, and we suffer, and God gives us a victory, and then he goes, Good job, guys. You finally made it. That's just not God. God says, Oh, you're going to listen to me? Let me tell you the plan. And he almost acts like everything else didn't happen. Take everybody up. Go ambush the city. Kill the king. Burn the place down. But by the way, all the stuff, you can have it. Yeah. You can have it. Because you're doing what I said. Now, last time they lost 36 people. So you can see, when you get victory, God blesses you. But you won't see the blessing until you deal with the sin. So important. So important. So important. So here's what I want to do. I want to show you something that I was shown a long time ago. Well, not a long time ago. A couple years ago. Of course, when you're as young as I am. A long time ago is a couple years ago. But that being said, I want to show you something up here on my fancy, fancy PowerPoint. And it's actually a biblical map of the Christian life. So sometimes we go, man, 
God left me here, and all I'm supposed to do for the rest of my life is read my Bible and pray every day and grow, grow, grow. <laughs> Guys, there's way more to it than that, and I want to show you. Let me see if I can help you. Let me see if I can help you. First of all, i got to put in a red sea. Why is it red, Stephen? Don't ask the other question. Okay. The next. Okay. So this is the Red Sea right here. We've got to go all the way to the bottom, right? So the Red Sea on this side, we're going to picture Egypt. Now, Egypt has always been a picture of the world, okay? That's this, anybody that goes to church knows that, okay? Egypt is always a picture of the world. Now, this on our map is going to be where we all start. So if this was the Google Maps, it would say you are here. But it's not, so we're going to skip that part. Now over here, we're going to put in the Jordan River, okay? Don't get lost. This is in-depth topography here. Okay. Okay, here's what we got. Jordan River, Red Sea. I'll even mark these so that you know what they are. Just saying. Don't want to confuse anybody. Okay, now, this part right here, you can guess what is between the Red Sea and the Promised Land. Wilderness. Boom, there you go. So you guys got the wilderness down. Who can tell me what they did in the wilderness? Ooh, you guys are on the ball. Okay, the bottom line is you know all these dots. So what I'm going to try to do is connect it and make a picture. The wilderness wandering is after the Red Sea, but before the Promised Land, which is obviously on this side. This side is Canaan. Okay, that's obviously the Promised Land. Now I'm going to tell you some things that are true about this. I want to I want to just back up here and show you a couple things that are true about this. We're gonna we're gonna look at the picture here. The picture goes like this. This is where we were born, and we were born in sin. Yeah. Okay? But then the Jordan River, or the Red Sea, sorry, the Red Sea is a picture of salvation. Now, I want to look at that for a second. When they went to the Red Sea. Who took them there? Moses. Okay. Who under whose guidance? God's. When they got to the Red Sea, who parted it? God did. Who went across it? There you go. I'm just, I'm just connecting dots here. So then, once they crossed it, who closed it? Did the children of Israel have anything to do with that? No. What did they do? They walked across. That's it. Same thing. With this, the way that you cross the Red Sea in salvation is by God's grace yeah. through faith. Wow. That makes sense? Wow. Uh, that This is basic stuff. But again, this is foundational. If you get this, the next story goes up so much faster. And it actually makes sense. So we cross the Red Sea, salvation, by grace through faith faith. Now we enter this place. I can't talk and write at the same time, so if I spelled that wrong, sorry. All right, so we enter this place called the wilderness, okay? Now, here's what happens in the wilderness. Moses brought these people in, and they were, they literally, if you read the, if you read Exodus, and you read the story, the account of them coming out, they literally go right to the Jordan River in a short time, very short time, and they say, okay, God says, I'm going to take you across. Send the spies in, check it out, come back. No, nope, it's impossible. And God says, okay. And they say, yeah, we don't want to live our... See, this represents the actual Christian life. Like, this is, this is where you're supposed to be. This is where the real Christians are. This is where they live and operate. And you say, well, what's this? This part would represent a couple things. First of all, in this portion, you were in bondage to sin. Okay? In this portion, you were in bondage to you. Yeah. 
You're not in bondage to sin anymore. God took care of all your sin. Now you're in bondage to you. And then look at this. You know, on, on the far side here, you would be a servant of Christ. Now, I wanna, I wanna, I'm going to say some things that I'm time to write it all up there. So look at this side. In Egypt, you were, you were in sin, in bondage to Satan. Okay? In the wilderness, though, you're not in bondage to Satan and sin anymore. You're in bondage to you, to self. Yes. Okay? You're also in the wilderness. You are in carnality. Usually we talk about that as like a Christian who's doing super, super, super good, and then all of a sudden he just like goes downhill and backslides and goes out and lives like the world. The truth is there's a lot of pastors and evangelists and teachers and preachers and parents and Sunday school workers that live here. They're not doing it by the Holy Ghost and by God's power. They're doing it by self, and they're a servant to self, and they're doing it in their own strength. And that's just as much carnal as the Christian that's out living in the world. So that we don't want to be there either. So, check this out. Discipline of the Holy Spirit in the wilderness. How many times in the wilderness did they start griping about something? And God had to tan their hide, had to correct them, had to lovingly send fiery serpents in to bite them and get them back on the right track. You guys see what I'm saying? Well, numerous times were they under correction of the Holy Spirit. They were being disciplined by God because, guys, this was never the goal. God didn't say, guys, I'm going to take you out of Egypt. I'm going to deliver you through the Red Sea. And then I want you to wander here for 40 years until you get the Christian life figured out. No. He said, I'm going to take you out of here and to a land that is flowing with milk and honey. That's the end goal. So we're going to get there. And so the last thing is you coexist with Satan. And you say, what in the world? Okay, basically, you're not a threat. You're not a threat at all. You're not doing a thing to oppose his kingdom. In fact, you're more distracted than you are working for God. You're a Sunday guy, you're a Wednesday guy, your Bible's optional, and you spend more time playing video games and watching movies than you do anything else. Mm. Outreach, whatever. Passing out tracts for the preachers. Hey, that's just life. And I'm not necessarily saying... You guys are the only ones who are doing it. I'm saying there's adults. That, guys, statistically, you're 50 years old, physically, before you start to figure this out. Statistically, Christians will get saved and spend the first 20, 30 years as a Christian wandering in the wilderness, and they don't get this figured out. And then when they're 40 and 50, they get it figured out, or they drop out. <laughs> That's, that's statistically. Now, I know that statistics aren't everything, but I'm saying you coexist with Satan. You are not a threat at all. Yeah. Now, let's look at the last part. Once we, I'm going to show you how to make it here, but once we make it over here, let me show you what's there. First of all, the biggest thing that you could possibly have um, is self is dispossessed. Basically, what that means is you're not doing what you want to do anymore. You're yielded to the Holy Spirit. And we're not talking about 24-7 gig. We're talking about as often as you can possibly be yielded to the Holy Spirit. Every time God prompts you, you are yielding to the Holy Spirit. You are, you are training yourself to say no to you. And every opportunity that you get that God touches you, you yep, that's what I'm doing. That's why I'm here. That's what that is. Follow on? Okay. Look at this, look at this. It's almost the same. We could say that, remember when, when you were above God, you were telling God what to do? That would be this position here. And then when you say, okay, God, I'm going to take the lowly seat at the bottom of the totem pole, you can go back where you belong. And whatever you say, you can do it. That's where you're at here. Does that make sense? That's where this afternoon lesson fit in, which it totally fits in. So you are in bondage to Jesus Christ which is the best thing you could possibly be. Amen. And I think it's interesting, all of these places, you're in bondage. You're in bondage to sin, you're in bondage to yourself, or you're in bondage to Jesus Christ. Take your pick. Which one would you rather be in bondage to? Okay? This is spiritual maturity. This is spiritual adulthood. This is how you, that, that's where you're at. You want to grade yourself spiritually? Where are you on the chart? Okay, if you're over here, that's spiritual maturity. You are an adult. Paul would say, you can eat meat. 
because you're aged. You're grown up enough to actually be able to, to, to walk the Christian walk. Look at this. You are under the control of the Holy Spirit. Just like before, when you were on top telling God what to do, now we switch it back. God's on top telling you what to do. And you are his yes man. When he says jump, you say how high? You don't say, I don't want to jump today. You see what I'm saying? Now, look at this last thing. Look at a couple more things with me. Christ is your life. You don't say, well, my life consists of this, and I go to church on Sunday. Guys, you have the attitude when you're over here? When I get up in the morning, I really only have one goal. My day can fall apart, and I could end up in the ER tonight with absolutely nothing. My house burned to the ground. And I really only have one goal for today. And that is spend some time with Jesus Christ and be in submission to him. That's it. Talk about a simple life. Man, it's a lot easier to accomplish one goal than a bazillion and add God on top of it. You see what I'm saying? Think about this. Think about this with me. You've heard this your whole life. You memorized it this week. What's the first, what's the first commandment out of the Ten Commandments? Someone tell me. Thou shalt have no other God before me. What does that mean? Thou shalt have no other God before me. Okay. Let me, let, me, let me explain it, how pastor explained it to me, and this was so cool. This is why you hang out with wise people. I was in his office one day, and I'm just talking to him. And he says to me, Stephen, you ever think about the first commandment? And I thought, what is the first commandment? <laughs> and he was like, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Oh, yeah, yeah, like that one. And he's like, you know what that means? What do you think it means? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no, tell me what you think it means. And he says, Stephen, People often think, put God on the top of your list and then have everything you want. But he said, think about it like this. God's got a throne room and his throne is right there. And he says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Yeah. I'm it. Yeah. I'm everything. Yeah. There is nothing else. Amen. There is no, I've got God and this hobby. Anything else is expendable. Yeah. That's spiritual maturity. Now, you're going to have to figure out by the end of the night where you are. Because honestly, everybody in the room is somewhere. Right, right. And so realistically, just be honest with yourself and say, Ooh, I'm not where I want to be. And then, Lord willing, you can get where you want to go. Mm -hmm. So that being said, let me explain some things to you. The problem, and I, I, I looked at this a little bit. Let's look at when you're a sinner, how you get saved. This would be crossing the Red Sea here. Salvation. So first of all, you have a problem. Okay. Then God convicts you of that problem. After God convicts you of that problem, he presents you with the solution. I sent Jesus to die on the cross to pay for your sins, to make a way for you to get to heaven and to give you everlasting life, which starts the day you get saved, by the way, which is why you can move to Canaan land, which is the successful, victorial, victorious Christian life. It's way more than just, I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Yeah, I think we've sold God and you short because that's all you've heard your whole life. If you don't know for sure, when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Get that taken care of. There is nothing more right than that. But there's so much more to it. Yeah. That's why you're still here. <clears throat> Just saying. Okay. Now, after God presents that to you, you have a choice. You're standing over here. Sin is about to destroy you. And you have a choice. Um, no, not going to go, God. I like my sin too much. I like the leeks and the garlics back in uh, Egypt land. So you stay. You don't get saved. Or you... By grace through faith, God's grace through your faith, you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you cross this, now you're in the wilderness. Make sense? So that's how you get through the Red Sea. You get salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Amen. I'm not saying anything different than anything you've ever heard in your life about salvation. Okay? I'm just, again, trying to connect the dots for you. Let's go to the Jordan River and see if we can cross this thing. The Jordan River is exactly the same. You say exactly the same? Exactly the same. Our problem is we're here. That's the problem. Self 
is in control. You are in bondage to Satan. You are carnal, immature, and you don't believe what the Bible says enough to actually do it. You are, not, you are under discipline of the Holy Spirit instead of his blessing. And then, by the way, Christ is, is a, you're, you're co coexisting sorry, with Satan. We don't want to be there. That's our problem. So we say, God, I want a solution. He gives a solution. Check it out. He says, look, here's what I want you to do. You're a saint. You're a child of God. You can never cross this again. Okay? You can never go back here. You're always going to be on this side. You're either going to be in the wilderness or over here until the day you die. Right. Okay? Then he says this. What I want to do is I want to sanctify you. Now, if you open your Bible, you go to the book of Joshua, and you read about when they crossed the Jordan River, they did some serious cleansing before they crossed that river. You, see, you follow what I'm saying? And, and that wasn't to get their sins forgiven. That was because God says, okay, now I'm going to take Egypt out of you. Because yeah. yeah. they were in Egypt, but now Egypt is in you. Yeah. Right here. Egypt is inside of you. Yeah. And you say, but I'm saved. Yes, yeah, so what? Egypt is still in you. Yeah. Guys, they had enough of Egypt in them to make a golden calf when Moses was gone for 40 days. Right, yeah. Yeah. Egypt was still in them. You can't argue that. Yeah. And so our problem is we want to get Egypt out of us. And I think you guys are all on the same page. You want to do that too. So, yeah. but we're getting what we're getting at is God convicts you that you are here. And some of us go, oh man, I'm here. God's convicting me again. Guys, the only time that God convicts you is not when you need to get saved. God convicts you all the time. Or at least I hope he does. He does me. And so when you're here, though, God convicts you about that. Amen. He brings up the fact, guy, you are not where I want you to be. Amen. I want you to grow farther than this. Yes. And sometimes we just go, I don't feel like a super successful, joyful Christian, so I must not be saved. Guys, no. Now, if you're not saved, you got to deal with that. And I'm not saying everybody that says they're saved is saved. You follow what I'm saying, though. Yeah. Okay? Just because you don't feel saved doesn't mean that you didn't, at one point in your life, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. It's not what that means. We don't go by our feelings. We go by the facts. Amen. Now it says, the solution is to know what the Bible says about this. The bi learn biblical principles and apply them to our life. Romans chapter number 12. Quickly turn there. Quickly. You say, Stephen, I've been here before. I know. These are all dots that you've seen. All I want to do is connect them, okay? Romans chapter number 12, verse number 1. Once you knew the solution, you were faced with the next thing. You knew about salvation, you knew how to get saved, then you had a decision to make. I'm about to set you up with a solution. I'll explain it to you. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren. Guys, do you ever want the Apostle Paul to tell you something? I would love to spend 20 minutes with the Apostle Paul. Guys, for real. If there's one Bible character that I could spend time with, I would spend time with the Apostle Paul. He was an absolutely incredible person. And I'd love to spend time with him. But he wrote your letter. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. How do you get saved? By grace. God's mercies that we're not consumed already. By the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Guys, that happens once. That happens once. He said present. Not present and present and present and present and present and present. He said, present Amen. your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You know what he said? You're going to have to trust God enough to let go of absolutely everything in your life. Amen. Everything in your life. Every dream, every desire, everything. Amen. And if God crushes it into powder and throws it out the window... I'm fine with that. That's what that is. Wow. Now, that sounds scary, but look at it this way. If there's a God that knows all of that, and there's us who knows a tiny bit of this, who do you think makes a better plan for our life? Yeah, amen. Hey, that's not yeah. as scary. Well, 
That's not as scary. Guys, if God laid out his plan for me, even if it was super scary, I'd take it in a heartbeat. Amen. Because his plan is always going to be better than my plan. Okay? Now, the wine, we're, we're getting down to the nitty gritty here. Look at verse number two. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the, whoa, look at the renewing part. That looks like it's ongoing. That doesn't look like it's a singular time. By the renewing again and again and again of what? Your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of Amen. God. You want to know how you cross the Jordan River, go to the promised land? It's actually pretty simple. At some point in your life, you will come to the place where you reach the end of yourself. You take all your ideas and stuff and you say, God, I'm willing to trade all of this. Amen. It didn't work. Some Christians, like I told you about, the vast majority wait until they're 40 or 50 years old before God brings them through all the different things in the wilderness and they finally get to the place where they say, all right, I'll give up. I'll go to the promised land. You see what I'm saying? And then God says, okay, give me what's left. I'll take anything that you give me. Give me what's left. What? It'd be way better for us if we did that now. Yeah. Why would you wait 50 years to do this? Amen, amen. Guys, you're in the wilderness. You're eating manna. And you're like, uh, I thought the Christian life was supposed to have milk and honey and rich and fertile and victories and battles. And God's like, you're not in Canaan. You're in the wilderness because you're still running your life. I'm not running your life. Amen. Amen. The way to cross the Jordan River is to see that and then believe it. Too easy, Stephen, how you got saved. You saying salvation is too easy? God needs to make it harder? Guys, why would he make sanctification any harder than justification? Why would he make it any harder? He already knows that we're dust. He already remembers that we're like puny and weak. Duh. He's trying to make it simple for us. That we can rely on him and he will give us the strength that we need to take us to Canaan. So the same way that you cross the Jordan River, river, Elmo Fudge, uh, is by <laughs> grace through yeah. faith. Amen. That's it. Amen. That is it. You come to the place where you say, God, I'm trading the throne in. Because here's what happens. That, going back to the, the throne room in our life. We have a throne room, and back here, Satan's on it. We're on it. We're controlled by Satan. We're enslaved to Satan. And then we get saved, cross this, and we understand salvation. We believe it. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ comes in, washes all of our sins away, cleans out the throne room, kicks out the devil, puts in his righteousness, clothes us as his son in righteousness, and we go, Ooh, you sure turned up this place. This place looks nice. I'll stay. Yeah. And God says, well... There's one more renovation I need to do. What's that? You're sitting in my seat. I've always sat here. I mean, ever since I was little, I learned to live independently of you. Guys, if I could change one thing, I wish I could get saved at birth and never learn how to live independently of God. Because before we got saved, we didn't have anything else. We had to learn how to survive how to go through every day and make it somehow without God. And the problem is we got good at it. And now we're too good at it. And God says, I want you to depend on me. Amen. In perspective, Adam and Eve were perfect. How many times did they walk with God every day? Perfect people. They've walked with God twice a day. We're imperfect people. How much should we depend on God? A lot. When you, by faith, come to the place where you say, God, as best I know how, I'm standing up. I'm stepping off the throne. And I'm not going to reserve it. It's yours. You sit down. And I don't care what you tell me to do. I'll sit over here, and you can just do whatever you want. Guys, that would be scary. But you know God. Guys. He's God. Amen. You can trust him with this. Amen. 
It'd be stupid not to. It'd be silly not to. To have a God that you can't understand, that you can't wrap your mind around, that's infinitely smarter, wiser, bigger, stronger, faster than you, and you say, how about you just give advice? That's this. Guys, you want him on it. So here's the practical side. At some point in your life, you just like you got saved, there's a moment in time where you say, okay, God, I'm done. And it's either when you're at the end of your rope and you're sitting on the ash heap of your life and you're strung out on drugs and alcohol because many people come to God that way that are already saved, by the way. They're already saved. And they just ran their life into the ground. And then they give it to God. And God will take it. Hey, and again I will build thee, and thou shalt be built, and I will be your God, saith the Lord. He'll take the pieces. So if you're broken, I don't exclude you at all. Amen. Okay? I love God. He plays with Legos. Again, I'll build it. Anyway, and so, but you get him off the throne, you move out of the way, and then God comes in and he says, I'll sit down. Now here's the problem, guys. Oftentimes, we are so good at being in charge. We move God. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I didn't expect my parents to say that. I've got this. Hold on, God. I I want that. I want you're not talking to me right. I need no just a moment. Step, step. Okay. You see what I'm saying? That's where the renewing of your mind comes in. You already crossed over. You already said, God, it's all yours. I give it to you. Everything. Everything in every way is yours. Crush it. I don't care. Take all my hobbies. Take all my dreams. Take all my plans. Take all my gold. I want your plan for my life. That's what this is. Some of you are not ready. That's okay. God will bring you to that place. That's why they had so many problems there. Because God didn't want them to stay there. He was trying to get them ready, get them motivated to get over to this side. So you either go willingly, or like the sheep, the more resistance, the more pressure the shepherd has to put in order to get the sheep to do what he wants it to do for the sheep's benefit. For your benefit. So, finishing up here. The renewing of your mind. What, is, what does Luke say? If any man come after me, let him first deny himself. Take up his cross daily, whatever you want me to do, and follow me. That's why you need to have daily devotions. Literally and for real. Amen. What do I do in my daily devotions? Nothing else. Get on your knees. Read that verse in Luke and say, God, I'm here again. I don't want to run today. You run it for me. Yeah. Yeah. And you say, yes. again? Yeah. Every yeah. Guys, if you do that for the rest of your life, yeah. you would turn the world upside down. Amen. God would do it through you. Because he wouldn't have a bunch of Christians sitting over here going, I wish God would use me. I want that. I'm watching this show. Hold on, i got to entertain myself because I'm not living a fulfilled life over here. Trying to find meaning and acceptance and happiness here. You'd find all those things in Christ. And then he would use you to turn the world upside down. Take your pick. It's your life. You're going to choose. In closing, I want you to do me a favor. Turn to John 15, verse number 20. John number 15, verse number 20. Oftentimes we feel like quitting. And sometimes we're content with our life. And Satan, he's content with us living in the wilderness. And as soon as we get over here into the promised land, that's when Satan really starts attacking you. Guys, I'm getting this. I can't rush. I can't rush. We'll work on this. Okay. John 15, 20. If you have it, stand up for me. Just one person. Gigi, read it for me. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I should have turned there too. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his word. If they have heard, heard him, they No, that's it. Have a seat. So here's the thing, guys. You're not better than Jesus Christ. And the number one thing that we want is a pain-free zone. And you know what Jesus said? You're not better than me. If you were of this world, they would love you. 
you're not of this world. Even if you try to fit in, you're not of that world anymore. So the world's going to hate you either way. So then he says, you know what you should do? You just be okay with suffering like I do. You know what someone said? They said, Steve, I wish I was perfect. I thought if I was perfect, everybody would like me. And I thought, who is the only God that was perfect? How many people hated him? That ain't realistic. If you were perfect, they'd crucify you. So I'm kind of glad I'm not in that category. But here's what happens. In, in Philippians chapter number 3, verse number 10, that I may know him. What's your goal? Guys, when you're over here, you're worried about you. I'm not going to go to the promised land because I'm going to get crushed by all them giants. When you're over here, you worry about him. Yeah. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection. How? By his sufferings. i got to go through his sufferings so that I can know him in the power of his resurrection. Yes. Guys, you're supposed to be in the promised land. This is a map of your life. You're on it. In closing, turn to 1 Peter 1. I want, I want you guys to see what I see. It is incredible. 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 15. 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 15. It's almost done. 1 Peter 1, 15. But as he which hath called you is holy... So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Guys, do you realize that Jesus said in Matthew, I will build my church, that's you, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, that's you. Here's what we get in our mind. We say the church is a hospital. The church is for hurting people. The church is for the lost to come and get saved. And all of those things are true and right. But I, I never understood that verse until I really gave it some thought. Do you not realize what that verse implies? That verse implies that there's a fortress and there's a gate. And the gates of hell will not hold you from a victory. I always wondered how gates could attack us as the church. And then one day, God said, hey, dum-dum, you're supposed to be attacking it. What? Yeah, that church is supposed to be in a military outpost that has a hospital. Amen. You are supposed to be changing the world. Yeah. And God says, even the gates of hell aren't going to stop you. When you're living in submission to me. Yeah. When you are in the promised land. And every day, denying yourself the right to rule and to do what you want. And to take up your cross and to follow me daily. You know what God's fashion is? Holiness. Why don't you ditch your fashion statement? Why don't you get God's fashion statement? Amen. Huh? Amen. Why don't you ditch your hobby and get God's hobby? What's God's hobby? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them all things with the I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the earth. Amen. Sounds like the gates of hell to me. But you know what we're doing? How is your food today in the hospital? Are you feeling better? I saw you had an emotional day in the wilderness. Guys, grow up. The church, you are supposed to be an outreach. But you, you're not going to do one ounce of conquering AI or conquering Jericho or conquering any other place in the promised land. You're still in the wilderness. It starts by presenting your body one time a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and then when you slip up and when you fall seven times, God reminds you and you say, oh, I'm getting up again. I'm going after that again. Why? Not because I'm a Christian and I've got to muster the strength to do this, because you're a saint 
that's been saved by God, empowered by Him to live the Christian life and victoriously take down strongholds of Satan. Wow, isn't that a change? And you thought you were just going to live a regular life, have some kids, grow up, and then die as an old happy American. I think you guys got something to do. I think I've got something to do. And then we say to God, I got I gotta I gotta play this game real quick. I gotta invest some money in, in this this game. I've been playing it for several years now. I don't know when the last time was that I, I went out by myself and actually tried to make a difference in my community and invite people to church or witness to anybody. Cashiers, you know, not giving them any tracks, like what in the world? Do you expect me to be a Christian or something? Do you expect me to make a difference? No, I'll let them come to the hospital. And once they come to the hospital, they can get help. Do you see a problem? I think God sees a problem with us. I'm included. You know what I think God wants? After that first decision, you're going to fall. You're going to mess up so bad. You're not going to be in the wilderness. Though. You're going to be in Canaan. Amen. And God's going to say, Get up off your face. Look at me. There's a problem. Deal with the problem. Go on. Go take AI. Go take a victory. Stop whining. Get up. Talk to me about the problem. Deal with it. Kill that guy. Burn him to the ground. Go win AI. Right now. Take everything you've got. I'm with you. I'll deliver it in your hands. Guys, defeat just shows there's a problem. Deal with the problem, and then run ahead. Run. Run. Save. Guys, we, you and me, our, you guys, right here, if you do this, you can change the world. <coughs> what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Right your head and push right, please. I'm not going to manipulate anybody down the aisle. And I, I really, it's up to you guys. You are on the map. There's a spot where you live. And you guys know where it is. If you want to cross Jordan, everybody stand up, stand to your feet. No piano, no nothing. If you need to come talk to God, if you need to come cross Jordan, do it. <coughs> if you need to come say, hey, I crossed Jordan, but you know what? I'm waiting because AI is here. And I, I landed on my face, God. You know what? It hurt. So now I think everybody's going to die. He's going to give up. And God says, get up off your face. What are you doing? I gave you the victory. Deal with this problem. And then go on. Hey, I want you, I want you in the Canaan land. I want to be in the Canaan land. I don't want to be in the wilderness. Guys, 40 years of bland manna. Guys, nothing but will, uh, complaining, whining. Sure, they saw some victories. Yeah. They got enough quail to make them throw up. They were complaining too much. What a victory. You guys want to live in the promised land. That's where I want to live. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, maybe you would say, I've never crossed the Red Sea. I'm back in Egypt. You left me behind. Guys, why don't you talk to somebody about that? There's people that have crossed the Red Sea before you. They're standing around you. Just go talk to your counselor. Say, I, I want to get saved. I want to start this thing. And then, by the way, as soon as you cross the Red Sea, make a beeline for the Jordan River. And give God everything. Mm -hmm. Give it all. <coughs> the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. So why aren't you attacking? If any man come after me, let him deny himself. When was the last time you denied yourself of anything? Literally anything, much less anything spiritual.
Would there be a young person tonight who would say, Brother Dave, I've not crossed the Red Sea. Last night, one of our young men went to a counselor and said, hey, I don't know for sure I'm saved. That counselor had the privilege of sitting down with the Bible and help 